We are living in a time where the capacity of humans to transform the environment has made us a global geological force. While sometimes a force for good, our actions can often result in global degradation. With human activity has come mass animal extinction, global warming, ocean acidification, drought and famine, environmental migration, and refugee crises. The key term used to describe this epic of negative impact is Anthropocene. Scientists often visualize the Anthropocene through numeric data, graphs, satellite pictures, and weather forecast animations, often missing the human face or the human actor. However, Italian cinema has recently become quite effective at visualizing the Anthropos of the Anthropocene. Three films that exemplify this well are the short documentary Il Capo by Yuri Ancarani, Matteo Garone's Gomorra, and Paolo Sorrentino's La Grande Bellezza. Through their films, these directors help us consider the central role we play in environmental degradation. By putting these representations in dialogue with some of the most compelling theories of the Anthropocene, such as Bruno Latour's re-evaluation of modernism, Rosie Bredotti's posthumanism, Stacia Lemo's material feminism, and Jedediah Purdy's environmental political theories, we can better understand how ecocriticism and posthumanism are approaching the Anthropocene. In the short documentary Il Capo, Director Yuri Ankarani visualizes humans' inherent connection to the Anthropocene as an internal and not external force. Our actions provoke a reaction to which we are not immune. In Il Capo, Ankarani follows a capo cava, the person in charge of the excavation of marble in a quarry in Carrara. Importantly, the presence and actions of humans in the environment is not expressed by verbal communication. Ankarani relies only on the ambient sound of the machinery. Through several close-ups, the camera focuses on the capo cava's hands and the small gestures he uses to control the heavy machinery that excavates the mountains. The capo cava is literally a geological force, as the mountain strata move as a direct result of the twitch of a finger. Moving away from him through the use of long shots, we witness the marble being cut and the mountain crumbling at his feet. But this quintessential anthropos, this master of nature, is not outside the environment he controls and gives shape to, and he is not immune to the control that the environment exercises back over the anthropos. The capo cava's skin is burnt by the sun and eroded by the white dust of the rocks. The images of craggy mountaintops are followed by the image of his furrowed brow. Two of his fingers are severed. The powerful hands that have been shown to control nature have also been damaged, which demonstrates that they are not disconnected from the environment they give shape to. The Anthropos is not an external geological force. There is no immunity for our species in the Anthropocene. As Bruno Latour points out, the divide between man and nature has the shape of a Moebius strip, meaning it has only one face and one border. In Stacy Alemo's words, to counter the dominant figurations of the Anthropocene, which abstract the human from the material realm and obscure differentials of responsibility and harm, I propose that we think the Anthropocene subject as immersed and enmeshed in the world. Anthropos is at the same time the agent and one of the targets of this new epic, and this short Italian documentary shows us the marks left by the Anthropocene on the bodies of the Anthropoi. The same is shown in the bedroom scene in Matteo Garone's Gomorra. In the bedroom scene, Tony Servillo is meeting with a family of farmers to renegotiate the terms to illegally dump toxic waste on their land. While three of the family members listen to Servillo, buying into his scheme, Garone focuses the audience's attention on what is happening at the center of the frame. The scene is staged like a pietà, or a painting of the Passion of Christ, as in the focal point of this wide shot lies the patriarch of the family, a sick old man, literally a povero Cristo, whose suffering is caused by the original sin of the Anthropocene, 
over production and garbage. In this scene, the poisonous waste dumped in the countryside of Campania reemerges and becomes visible as an unstoppable cough and a terminal illness. Anthropos is one of the victims of the Anthropocene. Since in the Anthropocene, there is no distance between humans and the endangered environment. No separation exists between man and nature. Therefore, in the Anthropocene, human exceptionalism reveals itself as a chimera, a false paradigm, a misconstrued ontological framework. Considering ourselves a special animal is not a fact. It is just one of many ideologies. Understanding this concept is the first necessary step to enter what Rosi Bradotti calls the post-human condition. In this condition, the binary opposition between the given and the constructed is currently being replaced by a non-dualistic understanding of nature-culture interaction. Garone, by showing how the human body is internal to the processes of the Anthropocene, emphasizes this post-human condition. This being natural of the Anthropos, this intimate entanglement with the biosphere that leaves behind the dualistic interpretation of our relationship with the environment, also leaves behind the false construct of our complete understanding and dominance over nature. In the Anthropocene, nature becomes both part of us and new to us. We did not see the Anthropocene coming because we did not really understand the complex relationships that constitute the Earth system. This is what Bruno Latour means when he says that we have never been modern. We have never been separated from nature or in control of it. This understanding produces a different idea of subjectivity, a post-human subjectivity, the subjectivity of an anthropos entangled with an environment that we do not control or even comprehend. The human stands inside an opaque and re-enchanted nature, looking for an alternative subjectivity, a way to find kinship with the complexity, the fascination, and the ambiguity of the biosphere. Maybe what Jep Gambardella is relentlessly looking for in La Grande Bellezza is actually this form of posthuman subjectivity. The search for the great beauty can be interpreted as the search for a new ontological paradigm that allows us to reach beyond the fallacy of the culture-nature dichotomy. Therefore, Sorrentino's film is staging a sort of coming-of-age of the Anthropos in the Anthropocene, a post-human Anthropos who lives in a city that has never been artificial, that is never really outside of nature. In fact, Rome is filmed as a living entity, and the life of its people is represented as entangled with the city, with each other, with the public memory of a celebrated historical past and with the private memory of an unspoken, nostalgic love. This city is a mesh that collects and connects all these lives and all these memories, while also being the natural temporary hub on the migratory route of pink flamingos. This is why nature culture is a false dichotomy. Rome is a living organism stretching through time and space, welcoming humans and animals. Rome's great beauty is what Rosi Bradotti discovers in Spinoza's vitalistic materialism and radical eminence, that is, the unity of all matter. In addition to visualizing Rome throughout the film as a unified and unifying living being, overriding the modern separation between natural and artificial, Sorrentino also presents a particular aspect of the post-human subjectivity in the specific scene with pink flamingos. At dusk, on Jep Gambardella's balcony facing the Colosseum, a flock of pink flamingos stops to rest during their seasonal migration. The close-up of Servillo's face reveals his pleasant surprise of this close encounter with nature, an enchanted nature that seems incorporated into the life of both the city and the characters. Here, Sorrentino inserts a dialogue between Jep and Suor Maria, where they briefly discuss Jep's search for the great beauty for a book he never wrote. 
Sua Maria then makes a strangely surprising reference to her diet based only on roots, roots that carry both a literal and a metaphorical meaning. Essa, perché io mangio solo radici. No. No, perché? Perché le radici sono importanti. Roots are important, says Suor Maria, because these roots represent, in a metaphorical sense, our historical origin and identity. But they also refer to physical roots, a simple food that reminds us of being at the same time, and without distinction, biologically animals and culturally gatherers. Suor Maria's holiness resides in being able to see and point out such awareness, that is, the understanding that anthropoi come from a nature they will never leave. The close-up of Suor Maria's face reveals the bliss that comes from this profound awareness of a simple truth, the truth that roots are important, that this primordial food still feeds the human animals who delude themselves into thinking they are above all other beings. The great beauty is ultimately the understanding, or actually the recollection, that the Anthropos who has become a planetary force has always been just another creature enmeshed in the unity of all matter, together with roots, flamingos, other people, a vast ancient city, and an entire planet. Roots are important, should be the mantra of post-human subjectivity. As pointed out recently by Jedediah Purdy, the role of representation and therefore of imagination becomes political in the Anthropocene. Imagination also enables us to do things together politically. A new way of seeing the world can be a way of valuing it, a map of things worth saving, or of a future worth creating. These three Italian films, Yuri Ancarani's Il Capo, Matteo Garone's Gomorra, and Paolo Sorrentino's La Grande Bellezza, visualize the Anthropocene and thus help us better understand it. Therefore, Italian cinema can also inspire a post-human imagination that could help us reconsider the ethical and political role we have as anthropoi, that is, as agents of global transformations in the geological epoch we are giving shape to. <laughs>